little gifts out there for the men of the church. So on your way out, please pick up one of those little gifts. There's a lot of kind of neat things out there. And again, the church picnic will be held next Sunday following the service. And uh, J2O will be our entertainment again this year. So lots of things going on. Do I have any other announcements this morning? Anyone? Mark? Uh, we did make some yesterday. If you weren't subs, uh, we will have them outside the door actually on the way out. Uh, we also have extra stuff, so there's quite a few Italians. Um, some with no money because we ran out of onions. Uh, but we also have uh, maybe one or two ham and cheese and one turkey. And so we also have pounds of ham, two dollars a pound. Uh, half pounds of salami, two dollars for half pound. Some American cheese, three dollars a pound. So that's you know a lot less than what you pay in the store. <laughs> just trying to get some of our money back that we spent on. So that will all be outside on your way out, outside right outside the door. All right, thank you, Mark. Anyone else? We'll continue with our service. John. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I just Susan. wanted to say that uh, next week uh, with the picnic, we're going to have a sprinkler for the little kids to run through. So, you know, the, you can come prepare for that. We, we can't hear it. Uh, okay. Hello there. <laughs> um, next week is the picnic. So, we decided to have a sprinkler for the kids to run through. So, they, you'll have to be prepared for that. Nice. Be prepared for some wet children. <laughs> <laughs> About adults. <laughs> so, we'll continue with our service. <laughs>
the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Please be seated. Bound his son Isaac 
Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you, that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day this said, on the mouth of the Lord, it will be provided. Here is the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord grant his blessing to the reading and the hearing of it. Let's go around as we pray together. Father God, we are so fortunate to be able to bask in your presence here this morning in this century. And we thank you, Father God, that today when we celebrate dads everywhere, that we can celebrate you as the perfect father of all of us. We know, Father, that you are the one that gives us the, the wisdom to know what a parent looks like, what a dad looks like. And Lord, we know that our fathers are not never going to live up to, to your example, Lord, but by your Holy Spirit, fathers can do a really good job. And we pray that they in their hearts would know how important their job is. We pray, Father God, as people who are going through a lot of changes. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you even as Abraham trusted you. That we would put all things under your authority. And that we would know that even when we don't understand, you're going to work things out. Because you have a better plan. Father, we admit to you this morning that we have tried to do things on our own. Somehow we are surprised when things don't work out or when the world chews us up and spits us out, Lord. And, but Father, it reminds us that we can do nothing without it. So this morning, Lord, we invite you to take control of our lives. We pray that you would comfort us. We pray that you would replace our despair with joy. That you, Father God, would lift us up and put our feet on lofty places and that we would remember that you have never let us down in the past and you're not going to start now. But Lord, even as we are the privileged ones to be here this morning, we are mindful of so many things so much, Lord. We, we do give you those prayers of thanksgiving, but Father, we pray for Jess, who is struggling in a place who is not near the resources that we have, Lord. We pray that you would keep her safe and her base safe and that she would continue to make a real difference for you in the Philippines. We pray for Hal, Lord, in his recent hospitalization. Lord, you know, he's got a lot of health issues and we just pray you would meet him in every place of need and comfort his heart. We pray, Father, for Alan Zacharias, Lord, that you would heal him. We pray right now for Brenda, Brenda Cup, Father, and we pray that even as she's in the hospital this morning, that she would look at the clock and that she would know that right here, right, right now, we are praying for her. We're praying that you take away her pain, that you give the doctors answers, Lord God. And we pray for she and Tim, Lord, that, that you would grow them together and that they would have a wonderful future together. Father God, for COVID sufferers wherever they are, frontline workers, small businesses who are suffering so, world governments, and people, and Lord, we pray for our country. Father, it says when we don't have words that your Holy Spirit will intercede for us with sighs that are too deep for human words. And Father, that's what we need when we pray for our country. We pray, Father God, for the persecuted church, for believers around the world who suffer simply because they call on the name of your son. And Father, we pray for ourselves because our needs are many. But Lord, we pray with great hope and 
expectation. Because Lord, we know how this ends up. You win. So Father, as we pray all these prayers along with the unspoken needs of our hearts, Lord, we we pray that you would hear the love that we have for you. As together we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray when he walked with us here on earth the first time. <laughs> Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Peter, right?
something is broken, that your favorite toy is broke. Uh, fathers are helpful, they give us advice, help fix things, and do all those uh, helpful things for us. And what's the next letter? E. E, that's right. And what might E stand for? What's that? Righteous. Righteous? That's a good guess, but not what I have. Yeah. Radical. <laughs> Radical? <laughs> 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 Could be. <laughs> right? <laughs>
this is an actual translation of a story that Martin Luther wrote for his family devotions. Of course, it would be in German. Mine's a little rusty. I don't know about yours. <laughs> Seriously, I never spoke. Abraham was told by God that he must sacrifice the son of his old age by a miracle. The seed through whom he was to become the father of kings and of a great nation. Abraham turned pale. Not only would he lose his son, but God appeared to be a liar. He had said, and Isaac shall be thy seed, but now he said, kill Isaac. Who would not hate God so cruel and contradictory? How Abraham longed to talk it over with someone, could he not tell Sarah? But he well knew that if he mentioned it to anyone, he would be dissuaded and prevented from carrying out the behest. The spot designated for sacrifice, Mount Moriah, was some distance away. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and sat with his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for a burnt offering. Abraham did not leave the saddle of the ass to others. He himself laid on the for the burnt offering. He was thinking all the time that these laws would consume his son, his hope of seed. With these very sticks that he was picking up, the boy would be burned. In such a terrible case, should he not take time to think it over? Could he not tell Sarah? With what inner tears he suffered? He girded the ass and was so absorbed he scarcely knew what he was doing. He took two servants and Isaac his son. In that moment, everything died in him. Sarah, his family, his home, Isaac. This is what it is to sit in sackcloth and ashes. If he had known that this was only a trial, it would not have been a trial, and he would not have been tried. Such is the nature of our trials, that while they last, we cannot see them to the end. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. What a battle he had endured in those three days. There Abraham left the servants of the ass, and he laid the wood upon Isaac and himself, and the torch and the sacrificial knife. All the time he was thinking, Isaac, if you knew, if your mother knew, that you are to be sacrificed. And they went, both of them together. The whole world does not know what here took place. The two walked together. Who? The father and the dearest son. The one not knowing what was in store, but ready to obey. The other said <coughs> that he must leave his son in ashes. Then Isaac said, My father. And he said, Yes, my son. And Isaac said, Father, here is the fire and here is the wood, but where is the lamb? He called him father and was solicitous, lest he had overlooked something. And Abraham said, God will himself provide a lamb, my son. When they were come to the mount, Abraham built the altar and laid on the wood, and then he was forced to tell Isaac. The boy was stupefied. He must have protested. Have you forgotten? I am the son of Sarah by a miracle in her old age, that I was promised and that through me you are to be the father of a great nation. And Abraham must have answered that God would fulfill his promise even out of ashes. Then Abraham bound him and laid him upon the wood. The father raised the knife. The boy bared his throat. If God had slept an instant, the lad would have been dead. I could not have watched. I am not able in my thoughts to follow. The lad was as a sheep for slaughter. Never in history was there such obedience, save only in Christ. But God was watching, and all the angels. The father raised his knife. The boy did not wince. The angel cried, Abraham, Abraham. See how divine majesty is at hand in the hour of death? We say in the midst of life we die. God answers, Nay, in the midst of death we live. When he had finished reading the story to his children, little Katie Luther said to her dad, I don't believe it. God would not have treated his son like that. And Martin Luther said to his little daughter Katie, But Katie, he did. Now the Old Testament story that we are stepping into today is the life and death test of one father's obedience and faith. Father Abraham is directed by God to sacrifice his only son as an act of worship on Mount Moriah. And one fails to move, the promised son that had brought comfort to this faithful couple in their old age is about to be lost. This is a pretty hard 
story. And it's a bizarre story. And quite frankly, it is a story for mature audiences only. But it is an account that stands as one of the best examples that we have of a father's faith in God and in God's power to provide. So this Father's Day morning, as we continue our leisurely stroll through Genesis, and as we celebrate dads and how important they are to the health and well-being of the culture, let's consider this event just for a minute from Isaac's perspective. Now, Isaac was Abraham and Sarah's miracle child. They were so overjoyed when he was born that he was treated like a prince. His name was Isaac. The name itself means laughter. That's how overjoyed they were when he was born. His mother even managed to banish his half-brother, Ishmael, out into the wilderness so that there wouldn't be any competition for his position in the family. Isaac had it all. So when Isaac's dad drug him out of bed before daylight, Isaac had a suspicion that it wasn't to go fishing. His father was serious. They were going to make this mysterious long trip. Now, I can only imagine the kinds of questions that were swirling around in young Isaac's curious mind. I mean, wouldn't you have asked, where are we going? Uh, isn't that the first question that your kids ask you? You know, it's summertime now. Jen said to me yesterday, she's like, well, how's your summer going? I was like, Jenna, I don't even have a realization that it's summer. <laughs> she's like, thank you either. But it's summertime, and they tell me the word on the street is that the road trip is making a comeback. You know, back in the day, John and I would get a yearly trip from Kansas City to Pennsylvania with two young boys in the back. And it was before the laws concerning car seats. Uh, we would begin right after supper on Monday, and John would drive through the night while the boys were sleeping. It was peaceful. And then in the morning, when the sun came up, John and I would trade off driving, and the questions would begin. Are we there yet? Are we going to stop and eat? And then the inevitable, I have to use the bathroom. Uh, Ian, quit touching me. Greg, quit looking at me. Which would prompt us to yell very, very same things like, okay, no one can ever touch or look at anyone ever again. Okay. <laughs> when the portable VHS player was invented, and we put a camp toilet in the back of the van, the ride finally became tolerable. But even then, there were questions. Because the inquiring children's minds always want to know. Think about young Isaac. Is this a camping trip, Dad? Why is it? Why is his mother coming? How long will we be gone? Isaac had to be asking those questions. Abraham knew where they were going. He was going to where God told him to be. So my question for dads this morning is this: When you get to where you're going. Are you going to be where God told you to be? It's a good time at the end of quarantine, at the beginning of a new chapter in all of our lives, for us to ask ourselves that question. We have an opportunity to keep the good lessons that we have learned and to reject those bad things that had become a part of our lives prior to this. If we pay attention, if we pay attention and we are careful, we can maintain slower pace. You know, we can prioritize those things that now we understand as being clearly important in case we missed it before. Uh, more important than all of that other stuff that the world tried to convince us deserved our endless attention and devotion. We have a unique opportunity to get back into the center of God's will. When you get to where you are going, Will you be where God has told you to be? Now Isaac's recorded question is in verse 7. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac knew that to worship God meant to give up something, uh, to delay something, to surrender something. Uh, to sacrifice something. It meant a lamb without blemish, uh, the best of the flock. Why would they be heading to worship when they didn't have everything they needed for the sacrifice? Sacrifice. What a strange word for Americans. You know, we come to worship in the 21st century 
and we want to get something out of it. <laughs> we want to get something out of it for ourselves. Somehow in our 21st century Christian minds, we have made church about us. We have made the whole thing something about us. To bring something to worship, I mean, that's just so unusual. That is a strange concept to us. To ask anyone in America today to wait for something, to give up a possession, to deny a pleasure or a reward, even for God's sake, that is unheard of in our culture. That's one of the reasons why this quarantine has been so tough on so many. But Isaac asked the question. Now, according to the dictionary, the word sacrifice means the destruction or surrender of something precious for the sake of something else. You know, as Americans, we're, we're not taught, we are not conditioned to surrender things that are precious to us. Americans just aren't good at sacrifice. Now, of course, this side of the cross, we understand that the sacrifice that God wants isn't an animal anymore. It's us. In fact, Paul finished up his teaching on righteousness, on the righteousness of Abraham in Romans 12. 12.1, this is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. We sing it this way. Give up your best to the master. So where's the sacrifice, Dad? You're supposed to give something up in worship. Most importantly, yourself. Now, I think there was another question on Isaac's mind. Now, I cannot prove that Isaac asked his dad this question, but I know children today are asking it. And the question is, will you be there? In a moment of great trial, will you be there? Can I count on you, Dad, to be there? You know, in the world in which we live, there are hordes of children who have been left to raise themselves. They get themselves off to school in the morning, along with their younger siblings. They come home to empty houses. They have parents who are consumed with self-fulfillment. You know when this whole COVID-19 thing started and they canceled school, I was really shocked about something. Nowhere were there any school administrators worried about the quality of online education. Do you know that? I mean, nobody was worried about online education. I mean, I guess they just figured, hey, it's going to be okay. Do you know what the primary concern was? Children getting fed. Did that hit you the way it hit me? You know, our daughter-in-law, Amanda, she was a public school teacher in the most notorious school district in Virginia. She came home with heartbreaking stories. It was actually the practice for the coaches in various sports, of which she was one, of course, right, right again, to violate school policy and provide rides home for sports participants. She said the very, very first game she went to shopping, there was not one person sitting in the stands to cheer on the young people. She said that she cried. The teachers, she said, provided rides for the kids who wanted to play so that they could play. One of her students who played did have a father who came to pick her up routinely without fail. But also without fail, he was falling down drunk. Her classmates would see them arguing with him to keep this young person from getting in the car with her father, who could not hardly speak. They did not allow him to get in the car. Her classmates watched that. And a teacher routinely took her home along with the rest of the kids that they delivered. In her class alone, three young women had multiple children before they graduated high school. And that was only in her class. There were others. There was a young woman who was running for prom queen, and her campaign poster had a picture of a little child saying, vote for my mommy. There are 
were so many other stories, but the one that made her stand up was one night she was sitting on the sofa and she was watching TV and the news came on and had a picture of one of her students. He had been arrested for murdering his mother. He had just turned 18, he's still in prison. So many children and young people need someone to care about what happens to them. Praise God for teachers who understand what their jobs really are and that is a ministry. But then you had Isaac, and he trusted his father completely. Dads, father figures, men, are you the kind of man that children can trust immediately? That's who you are called to be in this dark and dying world. Now, Father Abraham took the question that his young son asked him, and he answered him with an answer that is a thread that runs through the totality of Scripture, and that is, the Lord will provide. Dads, men, father figures, do you personally have enough faith to make that claim for the young people who you have influence over in your life? The Lord will provide. God will provide faith for whatever journey He calls you on. Now God and Abraham, they had climbed way too many mountains by this time for them to stop now, for Abraham to stop now. And as impossible as it all seemed, Abraham got up early one morning and set out for Mount Moriah. Now somebody much smarter than I once said, when things get difficult, don't pray for smaller mountains. Ask for increased climbability because the Lord will go with you when it is most difficult. Abraham said on a journey, he didn't have a clue where God, what, what God was doing. He didn't understand why. He didn't have a clue. But Father Abraham walked by faith in the journey. Dads, men, father figures, do you trust God in that way? The Lord will provide. Isaac trusted his dad, and his dad trusted God. Five, this far in, I'm sure you didn't. We will worship when we, and then we will be back. We, that's how it goes, verse five. We will worship, and then we will be back. Think about that. Abraham somehow knew that the Lord was going to provide for this journey. He knew somehow God was going to pull this out of the dumper. Abraham knew somehow that God was going to work it out, and he knew that God was going to give insight for the moment. You know, that level of drama is almost too much for civilized people. I mean, we shudder when Abraham arranges the wood, and we want to skip over the part where he ties Isaac down, and that microsecond in between the raising of the knife and the downward thrust that would end his son's life, and the angel of the Lord screams, Abraham. It's like watching an action movie, and it's got you on the edge of your seat. It's that dramatic moment of decision when Abraham almost sacrificed his son. That's when God provided. But I want you to think a little bit about that word almost. Now, I don't know what your life has been like, but I have had almost moments in my life. <laughs> the close calls, you know, the nearlies, the what ifs. I mean, I have had moments in my life, those squeaky moments when it could go on either way, you know? I mean, haven't you? I don't want to show hands. You know, when I think about the choices I almost made, the paths I almost followed, the accidents that I for not deserting me in the almost of my life. In the critical moment when life hangs in the balance, God speaks. Now, in Abraham's day, it was the practice of pagans to sacrifice their children. That was a part of their culture. And God was showing Abraham that it was not his way. And this morning is really good to remember that. Because the next time men... Any of you are tempted to sacrifice your young people on the altar of expediency, or money, or position, or self, or service to some other god in the world. In that moment of great trial, hear God call you by name. Look up and listen, because God is calling you. The Lord will provide. He will provide faith for the journey. He will provide.
provide insights for the critical moments of life, and he will provide blessings for all time. You know, one of America's best love hymns is the one that we continue to sing, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on a cross my burden bled the bury, he bled and died to take away my sin. In the obedience of Abraham, we can get a glimpse of the faithfulness of God, who was willing to sacrifice his son for our salvation. Now the obedience and the righteousness of one man continues to be a blessing for Christians like us. And on Mount Moriah, Abraham passed the test. He got a perfect score, but you know what? God also passed that test. Abraham obeyed, but God provided. And by faith, you and I can discover the nature of God, whose hand will always provide all that we need. The Lord will provide. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the benediction. Now next week is the picnic. It's pretty exciting. Everything is happening next week. It's like, welcome to your new life this week. But I want to give you a baptism story. You know, I was baptized as an infant on an Air Force base in Ohio. And I always wanted to be when we were baptized and was never given the opportunity because in Scripture, the only people that got baptized were people who knew what they were doing. I wanted to fulfill Scripture in my life. So I never given that opportunity. And then creation happened. And Pastor Mark baptized me at creation. Like, like I'm a hundred. And he baptized me. I remember the Sunday that the twins, the older, the older, Shirley and uh, uh, Catherine. Yeah, 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 Catherine. And uh, we baptized them and they were like 90. I remember last year, was it last year that Kenny wanted to be baptized? Two years. Two years. Two years already. Oh my gosh. Time just goes. I remember Kenny sitting there and saying, you know, I want to be baptized. Anyway, so if that was you, you know, I know it's, it's sometimes difficult to uh, to make that decision. And that day, I remember when Heidi would be baptized and she climbed in and I said, I think you've got shorts on under that skirt. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> we were just free. <laughs> anyway, so we'll have, uh, if you, if you uh, feel so moved as I was to be believer baptized, please, uh, please let us know. Come prepared to, to get wet. But yeah. Our benediction is actually taken from Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen.
something more than that. She just leaves.